Dr. Curtis Hudson spoke for us last Sunday morning and also Sunday night. And I want to give you a portion of the Sunday evening service that was preached right here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church last Sunday night by Dr. Curtis Hudson. He's the editor of the Sword of the Lord, one of the greatest soul winners in America. And I want you to feel his burden as he shares with you some stories about how you and I, as God's children, should be willing to sow the seed to let others hear about the good news of eternal life. Dr. Curtis Hudson. The context of this psalm is 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah chapter 37. Hezekiah was king of Judah and they were attacked by Sennacherib and the Assyrian forces. And the city of Jerusalem was taken and they besieged it and surrounded it so you couldn't get into the city and could not get out of the city. That being the situation, they had to be careful what they did with the food they had because no food could be brought in. The food was very scarce. And so they probably put themselves on ration to say, just eat enough now to stay alive and save the other. They didn't know how long they'd be besieged, maybe a year or two years or three years. It turned out that they only lost one sowing season and reaping season. But when they were finally let loose and allowed to leave the city, those families going back to their farms had some decisions to make. Because the grain they had was just a little bit. Most of it had been eaten and they only had a little left. Therefore it was very valuable, valuable grain and they had some decisions to make. Should we feed this grain to our children? Or should we sow this grain? Or perhaps they were thinking, my stomach hurts and I'm very, very hungry. Should I eat this grain and satisfy my hunger? Or should I sow this grain? And the psalmist said, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless or without a doubt come back rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. Decision time. Just a little grain, shall I sow it or shall I eat it? As I read that psalm again the other day, I thought of this sermon title, Happy Harvesters. And if we be happy harvesters, there are three things we must sow. And the first thing we must sow is the Word of God. You remember that story back in, in Luke chapter 8? The story of the sower who went out to sow and some seed fell by the wayside and, and some fell on stony ground and some fell among thorns and some fell on good ground. And then the Lord gave the meaning of that particular story and he said, they that, that heard the Word... It was like those that fell among thorns. That was those that heard the word and the cares of the world rose up and choked it before it had time to take root. And he said, they that fell by the wayside were those that heard the word of God and before it could take root. He said, the devil came and took it away. Did you know the devil has power not only to put thoughts into your mind but to take thoughts out of your mind? In Acts chapter 5, Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? Why did Satan put it in your mind to lie unto God? He said, he gave him that thought. But here the devil takes the thought out of your mind. Did you ever wonder why it is it's easy to remember some beer jingle or, or cigarette jingle or some dumb commercial and you can't remember the preacher's sermon text last Sunday morning? It's not that you try to remember the other, but the devil helps you to remember the other while he steals away the word of God. And he goes on to tell about the sower and the, and the, uh, and the seed. And in Luke 8, 11, he said, the seed is the word of God. If we're to be happy harvesters, the first seed we must sow is the Bible, the word of God. I'm thinking of people that I know of that trusted Christ as Savior because somebody gave them the gospel. Somebody gave them the word of God. You see, it's not my job to save people. It's my job to tell folks how to get saved. If I tell them how and they do not trust Christ as Savior, then their blood will not be required at my hand. But if I don't tell them how and they die without Christ and go to hell, then I'll have to answer to God for neglecting my neighbors and my friends and my loved ones said how many people we let die and slip through our fingers. We never one time witnessed to them. We never one time gave them a gospel track. I'm thinking of a couple that I met. They were singers. They used to sing in nightclubs. They traveled all the countryside and one day they were in Florida singing in nightclubs. Did not much to do during the daytime so they were laying out on a beach sunbathing. 
and, and the, somebody winded up a gospel track and threw the gospel track down and the wind blew the gospel track over to where this fellow was laying. And he reached over and picked it up. He thought it was some kind of a note so he decided he'd read it. He opened it up and read it. He said, I stuck it inside my trucks, went back to my motel room later that day, took the old Gideon Bible and looked the verses up was in that track and there in that motel room I trusted Christ as my Savior. He said, my wife also trusted Christ as her Savior and we decided it'd be best not to go back to the nightclub that night. He said, so we called the man and told him we were not coming back. We'd just been saved. We trusted Christ as our Savior. He said, instead we called a preacher and went to see the preacher that afternoon. And the preacher told us about the Christian life, so we ought to get baptized. <clears throat> we ought to join a church, ought to read the Bible, another thing. And that couple never went back to the nightclub again. Rather, they began singing in churches all over America gospel songs. And the last time I saw them, they were still doing that. When he told me that story, I, I could visualize in my mind somebody on the beach passing out gospel tracts. And I could visualize some guy who was handed that track, taking it and wadding it up and throwing it down and maybe even cursing the guy that handed it to him. And the poor soul owner probably walked away in tears thinking, I've wasted my time and I've been humiliated. But God saw that track. And almost like God looked out of heaven and with his mouth whoosh, whoosh, began to blow the track over to where the guy was laying. And the guy picked it up and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And here's the promise. He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, and Luke 8, 11 said, the seed is the word of God, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's the promise of God. <coughs> I have a friend down in Florida, Tom Sexton. Pastors an aggressive soul winning church. He has a bus ministry. And one little girl comes to church, her dad is a drunkard. He wouldn't get saved. Tom went to see him, showed him how to get saved. A man would not get saved. He sent back several deacons and others to the man's house. They witnessed to the guy. The guy would not get saved. So Tom said to the little boys and girls that rode the buses, we'll memorize a verse every week. And each week you memorize your verse, I'll give you a little prize on Sunday. So this little girl went home and said to her drunkard father, who had been witnessed to several times but did not get saved, said, if you'll help me memorize my verse, I'll get a prize Sunday. And it so happened they were memorizing what some call the Romans road, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, and so on. <laughs> memorizing those verses. The little girl said to her dad, would you please help me so I can get the prize Sunday? And the, the man said, so she found the verse and he read it, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. But little girls don't learn very fast. So he had to read it again, and he had to read it again, and he had to read it again, and again, and again. And after about five or six times, he knew it by memory. It had been printed indelibly on the wall of his mind, but the little girl was still struggling with it. He had long since memorized the verse. <coughs> the next week, they had to memorize Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the little girl said, For all have been bad and God ain't glad. <laughs> well, he said, That's not quite the way it was, but we'll try it again. And they went over it again and again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Till the man memorized it. He could quote it in his sleep. <clears throat> Took the little girl a while to memorize it. The next week... They memorized Romans 5, 12, as by one man sin into the world and death by sin. And the fourth week they memorized Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the fifth week they memorized Romans 5, 8. <coughs> he read it, but God committed his love to us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he read it again, and he read it again, and he read it again, till it was printed in Delhi on the wall of his memory, and the man began to cry. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He had never been under conviction. He didn't know what the, what, what the Holy Spirit was or who he was. All he knew was he was crying and he was upset and he, and he needed some help. And he called the preacher and said, I need some help at my house. I don't know what's wrong, but, but I'm in trouble. I'm crying and I can't stop crying. And Tom Section said he drove out to the house and found a man ready to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior. And the guy got saved and came to church. Thank you, son. May want to baptize somebody in a few minutes. <laughs> and a man came to church, joined the church, got baptized, serving the Lord now. 
when the preacher couldn't get him saved and the deacons couldn't get him saved, that little girl just memorizing verse after verse got the guy saved. I'll tell you another story. It happened over in Tri-Cities, Tennessee. A man came on the Vietnam War. His wife got saved. The church members tried to get him saved. He wouldn't get saved. But he bought himself an old used pickup truck. Had the thing about three years. His wife begged him to go to church. He wouldn't go. Preacher came to see him. Wouldn't go. Wouldn't get saved. No, not interested. Don't have anything to do with it. And this man told me this story. He said, I was driving that old pickup truck one day. And he said, I had to stop suddenly. And when I did, he said, I'm under the front seat of the truck. Slid a gospel track. And it was his turn so I could read it. And he said, what must I do to be saved? That's Dr. Rice's old track. He said, I was afraid to throw it out because it's almost like God had done that. He said, I'd had that truck for three years. And I don't know, somebody put that track behind that seat before I bought it. It must have been like that five, six, maybe eight years. I don't know how long that track had been there. He said, but when I hit the brakes, it slid out. And he said, I picked it up and stuck it in my shirt pocket. Went home, got by myself, got my Bible, read the track through, trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Join that church. When he told me that story, he was a bus director at that church working full time. But what they could not do in visiting the guy, that gospel track did that came up under that seat that day. Hey, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. It's always easier to feed on the word than it is to sow the word. It's a lot easier to come to church and open the Bible and, and hear a good lesson and take the notes as it is to go out and leave the building and then take somebody on the street corner and hand them a gospel track or try to win them to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I used to write the sewing and column for the sword before I became the editor of the paper. And uh, a man wrote me a letter one day and told me a story. He said, I live in a certain town in Alabama. He said, it seems that people who drink beer and whiskey like to throw their bottles in my yard said every morning I get up I find several whiskey bottles or beer bottles laying in my yard he said he said I'd be so mad at picking them up I was so angry I wanted to kill somebody he said one day I thought to myself what will I do with these bottles I prayed and said Lord what can I do with these bottles that would be constructive and helpful he said the thought came to me that I should wash them all real clean take the labels off so as not to advertise any whiskey or beer and then I, he said, I'll put tracks inside the bottles once they're dry. Then I'll put a cap on the bottle and seal it. There's a little creek that goes right behind my house, he said. And I thought I'll just fill up those bottles every day with a gospel track, drop into those creek, uh, creek and see what happens to them. He said, I remember the promise in the Bible, my word will not return to me void. So he said, out behind my house, every morning I drop in 12, 15 whiskey bottles. And I'd pray as they floated away with gospel tracks in them. And in his letter to me, he said, I got one letter back from a man from over 9,000 miles away. The bottle went down that little creek and that had joined another creek and finally joined the river and finally into the ocean. And here's a guy on the other side of the world in the ocean sees a bottle bobbling along. He didn't know it came from Alabama. <laughs> All he saw was paper in the bottle. He thought, hey, somebody's left a note in this bottle where the buried treasure is, and I'm about to be a wealthy man, he thought. And he reached down and fished the bottle out of the water and burst it to read the paper inside. It was a gospel track, and the man trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He told me story after story like that about how the Word of God had gone around the world. You know, one day at our church, we had a little thing for the bus kids and other kids. I said, let's have a balloon release. We'll fill them with helium and put tracks in the balloons and send them away. And you know, one old lady in our church, a young one could have done it, but it hadn't been an old one this time. She complained and belly ached about that. This is a waste of time and money. Yeah. She'd make coffee nervous. <laughs> she'd have given aspirin a headache. I mean, she'd give a tranquilizer, a nervous breakdown. Yeah, this is a waste of time. And, money. and I wanted to say, why don't you sit down and shut up? <laughs> but she complained about it. And I said, Jesus, please let us hear from at least one of these balloons just for that old woman's sake. Did you know one day I got a letter back from a fella? He said, you won't believe this. He said, I was plowing in my field on the tractor. I was way back in the woods away from everybody. No houses, no nothing, no noise. Just the noise of my tractor. And I'm riding along on my tractor plowing my field. And all of a sudden I see this thing coming down out of the air. He said, it's coming right at me. 
as if it's seeking me out. He said, believe it or not, the balloon actually landed in my lap while I'm riding the tractor. He said, I turned the old tractor off and I could tell there was something inside the balloon. And he said, I shook it, it rattled. I, I took my knife and opened the balloon and inside was these tracks, he said. And on the back of that track, he had written his name and address saying he had trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Hey, if we're to be happy harvesters, if we're to come back rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us, then we must sow the Word of God. Don't ever tire of putting it out. It'll work. I was in a conference three weeks ago in Wadsworth, Ohio. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Tuesday they had a luncheon for pastors. And during the time we were eating a man that didn't look like he ought to be in the meeting, really he wasn't dressed for that kind of a meeting. He just came over and sat across me at the table. He looked at me for a few minutes. And then he said to me, can I ask you a question? I said, well, sure. I didn't know what he was going to ask. He said, you lost your brother last year, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. And then with a tear in his eye, he said, I lost my brother too. And a sister. I assumed it must be a car accident or something like that for both to die at the same time. I said, was it a car accident? He said, yes, it was. Both killed in a car crash. He said, was your brother saved? I said, yes, he was. He said, you'll see your brother again, won't you? I said, yes, I will. He said, I won't ever see my brother again. My brother wasn't a Christian, he said. I hardly know what to say to the guy. I just stood there and looked at him for a moment or so. And then I, I assumed he must be saved. So I said to him, well, how long have you been saved? He said, I'm not saved. I said, you're not saved? No, he said, well, I said, I can't do a thing about your brother and sister, but let's hope they trusted Christ before they died. Who knows? They may have. But while I can't do anything about your brother and sister, I said, I want to tell you how to be saved. Would you let me? He said, yes, you can tell me how. And I showed him how to get saved, opened the Bible, went through the plan of salvation. You know what? He did not trust Christ as his Savior. Most people I witnessed to do. And I couldn't believe the guy wouldn't get saved. I mean, he came to me. I didn't go to him. And he wouldn't trust Christ. I said, won't you please trust the Savior? Well, no, no, I won't do it. And I reached in my, you got a track, come on your tracks. And I reached in my pocket and pulled out a track. A little bit better than this one. <laughs> it says, how to know you're going to heaven. Or you can know you're going to heaven. But uh, I handed him a little track. I said, okay, if you won't get saved now, would you promise you'll read this track? Will you promise me that? And if you decide to trust Christ, will you fill out that little decision form on the inside where it's a place for your name and address? And will you write me and let me know? He said, I'll do that. That night I came back for the evening service and who was standing in the lobby waiting on me? But that guy. And he handed me an envelope with what just said Dr. Hudson on the front of it. And I had a few minutes before the service time so I went in the preacher's office, opened the envelope and there was a letter from this man telling me how much he enjoyed the conversation and encloses this little tract that I'd handed him. And the little prayer where it says, the best I know how I trust Christ as my Savior. He had underlined that with a pencil and put an exclamation point at the end of it and put his name and address below it, saying he had trusted Christ as his Savior. And I thought to myself, you know, the Bible is true. God's word will not return into him void. He didn't get saved when I witnessed to him, but however, when I gave him the gospel track, he read it that afternoon. You want it back? And he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Boy, he's tight, isn't he? He's very good. <laughs> he wants to keep all his tracks. Hey, wait a minute. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. These, these families leaving to go back to their little farms only had a little grain, not much left. And they had to make some decisions. Shall I feed it to my children or, or shall I sow it? Shall I eat it or, or shall I sow it? And sometimes you're out and you've got to make a decision. Shall I keep this track or shall I pass it out? Shall I witness this guy or just not say anything at all to him? And the promise is, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy.